Immigration reform often gets extra attention during campaign season. Donald Trump, who is currently running for the Republican nomination, recently said that he would build a more extensive wall across the U.S.-Mexico border. He also claimed that if elected president, he would end birthright citizenship and deport 11 million people who are currently living in the country illegally. There are many different perspectives on the border in the Southwest. Catherine Ferguson is an author and documentary filmmaker. She's worked on the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona for many years and recently stopped by our studio to share her reflections on art, politics, and the border. Catherine Ferguson, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. You spent many years as a filmmaker, traveling in the Sierra Madre in Chihuahua, Mexico, where you documented the lives of the Raramuri people. What was it like living down there for them? For me, what it was like, the first thing I had to learn was to be quiet, because that was the, the biggest dichotomy between the cultures, I think, is that we, from our American culture, we fill the air with noise, and they don't talk a lot. So one of the things I had to learn was just to be quiet and listen. Mm -hmm. I also learned that their lives are very, very, very hard. No electricity, no running water, a lot of illness. And I also learned that they're a lot of fun. The people are nice, they're fun, and they're just terrific to be around. In it, since the time you did uh, this documentary work, you've become a volunteer with the Tucson Samaritans, and you've brought food and water and medical supplies to migrants crossing the southern border between Arizona and Mexico. What has what that experience been like? Oh, that is a life changer. <laughs> um, I go with the Tucson Samaritans. We carry backpacks full of water, food, and first aid, medicine, first responder items. And we see people in the desert. We see people who are dying. We see people who are healthy but exhausted, and we find um, human remains. And so that you can't do that without having your life deeply affected. Are there people who disagree with what you do? Absolutely. <laughs> they, they say terrible things to us. There are also many, many people in the United States who agree with it. It's about more than being about politics. It's about saving somebody's life. It's 110 degrees in the Arizona desert. People have no water. They're, they're here under extreme circumstances. And if you meet somebody on a trail in that situation, you would not leave them alone. I mean, who would leave somebody in 100 degree, 110 degree weather? You just wouldn't do that. Now, Tucson is a pretty liberal bastion in <laughs> Arizona. Is there conflict between what you guys are doing there in Tucson and in the rest of the state? Yes, there's a lot of conflict. Um, Tucson, they call it Baja, Arizona sometimes. They want uh, to secede, <laughs> but it's not really that bad. But it's a, it's a university town, a lot of educated people, and we're right, we're 60 minutes from the border. So the culture is a mixed culture. All kinds of people live there. And um, more north in Arizona, it's very conservative. So mm -hmm. Why do you think they don't, that people in northern Arizona don't share your feelings about the humanitarian element of this, this migrant process across the border? That's a wonderful question. I have no idea why they feel that way. I don't know. I know that there is a lot of money and there are a lot of financial situations in Phoenix that would prohibit people from leaning to the side where you would go out and just give your time to help people. Um, I think it's just politics and economy of Phoenix. Speaking of politics, there are a lot of national politicians right now talking about the border and mm -hmm. you know trying to talk tough about <laughs> what they would do. Some of them haven't spent very much time down there. How do you feel when you hear them talk about border issues uh, knowing they haven't seen what you've seen? Well, I have a rock and a cave for every one of those politicians. <laughs> I would take, I have one for um, this man and this woman and this man, and I would take them out to the desert, and I would set them down with food and water and say, goodbye, I'll see you in three days. And, um, but seriously, of course, I wouldn't leave anybody out there, but um, nobody, they, none of them know what happens in the Arizona desert. Um, hardly anybody who's not there and not on the trails most people don't have a clue what happens out there. Why do you think that is? I mean, I, I think we've seen some of this on television and we've <laughs> read some of these stories. Why is it hard for them to uh, talk about it as a human issue rather than as a policy or an economic issue? It's about money. The um, United States Border Patrol 
they make a lot of money um, being out there. They have a lot of jobs for a lot of people. Building the wall is a very expensive proposition and it makes a lot of money. Having the private prison industry, they make huge amounts of money. They, everybody that is taken from the desert, they take the first 75 to 100 people and they put them in prison every single day. It's a private, private prison industry. A lot of these politicians have money in that industry. Drawing attention away from our border right now is the migrant crisis in Europe. As Syrians who are fleeing their war-torn country and other areas leave and try to make their way toward a better life in Germany and other parts of Europe, you have seen the effects of migration. You've been to Malta and Berlin looking at this. What similarities do you see between the migration crisis in Europe and what goes on near our border with Mexico? Well, over the years, I have come to think that maybe our situation of nation states in the world, the organization of our people in the world, doesn't work anymore. And what we're seeing is maybe the end of that era of time. I don't know what's going to replace it, but in every country, everybody's moving. And most people are moving for horrible, horrible reasons, from death, they're being killed. They have, I mean, the bombed out photos of, of the towns in Syria, there's nothing to live in. You know, they're just empty structures of buildings. So um, I have seen people crossing the Arizona border. I've been in Malta where we saw, we went into a prison, a man's prison with African prisoners who had no arms and they were missing legs. And they had come, they had crossed the Sahara and then they had gotten into little boats. They're told to get in the boats, 30 men in a boat given a compass and they said, keep that on north, goodbye. So they go into the ocean, into the, I mean into the Mediterranean at night and over 50% of them don't make it. And so that was a few years ago and now it's just compounded by war and economic situations. E economic situations are interesting here because some of these people we see coming, uh, you know, flooding through Greece and up into Hungary and into the rest of Europe are not actually fleeing war in Syria, but they're coming from other countries where they are facing economic hardships. That's correct. Do you think Europe should do more to take economic migrants? I think Europe, the United States, we should all take migrants. For heaven's sakes, uh, the world is not going to be the way we used to know it. It's already in massive change. And um, I am a person of very moderate income. I have so much living in the United States. I could have people in my house. I could give people, f I could share my food with people. So if that were done on an organized national level, yes, we could do it and Europe could do it, absolutely. And yet there are a lot of people who say we, there's so many things in this country that we say we can't afford now, our public schools for one thing. Right. We don't have enough money to have these schools look the way we would like them to look. How can countries, how can you say that countries like the US and Germany and other countries in Europe need to take on more economic burden. Do you think that we should instead be trying to increase economic prosperity in these other places? I think that if we increase prosperity for other people, our prosperity will increase. It seems to me that the people in control, the people that are running for president, the people in offices, those people, they have money or they have means to money. And we have enough intelligent people in the United States that we could feed ourselves we could give people jobs, and we could feed other people. You've been a dancer, a <laughs> choreographer, right. a documentary filmmaker, and now an author. Uh, which of these ways of creative expression do you feel are most powerful for you? Privately, dancing. When I have a bad day, I just lock the doors and I dance. <laughs> um, publicly, I think um, I love filmmaking, but it's highly expensive. So I think writing is the way to go for me. Catherine Ferguson, your book, The Haunting of the Mexican Border, is out now. It is. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much.